one of the things that we have to just, I'm just going to throw this out there right quick because this is a, like I said, it's a huge subject and um, I am not, I'm only going to scratch the surface. I, I want to give you uh, just an opportunity to ask the spirit to give you a hunger and thirst to understand these things more deeply. So that's what I'm, this is what my desire is. This is what I have asked God to give me for you. And before we look at any kind of uh, prophecies in the Bible, we have to know that we must use valid rules. Without valid rules, we can make prophecies mean anything that we want them to mean. And so rules are not, these rules are not something that anyone has come up with. It's rules that have popped out as these things have been looked at over and over again, like mathematics or aerodynamics or gravity or anything that's out there that God has allowed for us to discover. We didn't invent any of the rules for any of these things. They have been discovered. And then when we discover the rules, we can apply and wow, understand great and wonderful things. So it is with the Bible. There are certain basic things that we have to know in order to be able to allow the Bible to speak for itself. Julie, this allows us to read the Bible and be amazed at what it has to say. I'm going to read through these really quick because I'm not going to focus on them, but I do want, if you're, if you're just starting to learn about these things, I need for you just to know that up front, we must always apply rules. And these are four basic rules. The big, every prophecy has a beginning and an ending point, and events happen in the order that they're given. We can't say that seal five comes first because it's seal one and two and three and four and five. And so as we're looking at the unfolding of this, these things, they happen in order. And until we get to the seventh seal, the, the prophecy on the seven seals is not completed. Uh, fulfillment occurs when all the specifications have been met for that particular uh, prophecy. And l the language can be literal or symbolic. Uh, we have to consider the context and we have to look for parallel uh, language or parallel texts in the Bible. When we're studying something, we, may, we search for where God talks about these things in other places so that we can understand how God uses this language and what he's trying to tell us. And then when we're looking at timing, we have to look at the presence or absence of the Jubilee calendar. This in itself is an entire months worth of study. And if you will go on our faith ministry site, Christopher's done an extensive study on these. So, you know, if you want to know more, we invite you to our website and you start digging because that's, that's what it takes. So I'm going to, going to just do a little tiny bit of repetition in case you didn't join us last week. Please go back and look at part one um, because there are a lot of things that I won't be going over, but we looked at a great, amazing meeting that was called to order in heaven. And the Ancient of Days takes his seat, and there are billions of angels all surrounding the throne. There are, 20, there are 24 um, elders seated around the throne. Uh, we talked about four living creatures. It is an incredible, incredible, incredible sight to think about and behold. And we know that we see this in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 4 and 5. Uh, as, as John, the, the disciple, Apostle John, is writing down this vision because he's, he's taken to heaven and he's given this vision, um, he sees this book sealed with seven seals. And he knows that there is information inside of this scroll or this book that is very important in exonerating the Father. We know that Satan has brought accusations against the father's government. That is why Lucifer's name was changed to Satan. Satan means the accuser. So he has accused God of being unfair, unjust. And John weeps because no one is found worthy. He weeps because the father must be exonerated from these charges. And there, there's no one present that could do that. And then in walks 
the Son of Man. And he receives both the book and the scepter of power from the Father. He receives all attributes. And so Jesus takes front authority for the unsealing of this book, which is going to be our, fo our focus this week and next week, for the removal of the seals on the book so that the book can be opened. Now, this is one really, really neat, neat thought, is that though the information inside the book is the Father's foreknowledge and it will exonerate forever God's government and God's authority that God never uses his foreknowledge for how he treats others. He treats us with love no matter how we behave. God loves us no matter how we conduct ourselves because that is who he is. Now, are there consequences to our actions? Yes. But he loves us through all of that. And that's an incredible thing. Now, the Father sealed the book with seven seals. And this is the cool part. The information exonerates the Father, but the seals glorify Jesus. So the focus of the unsealing of the book is the glorifying of Jesus. And that is one of the greatest reasons that we can have confidence in God. You know, for the last month, I've been talking to you about how do you have confidence in your God today? How do you know you have confidence? Do you know why you believe what you believe? Because the days ahead are going to be like no days that have ever happened. If you believe what God tells us in the Bible, if you understand and if you have been studying and looking at end time prophecies, you know that some horrific things are coming upon this planet. And the majority of the church is going to fall away from their faith because the God that they thought they knew is not the God that is going to be presented during that time. It's not the God who's going to be revealed. He's going to reveal himself with great authority. So it's so important that you and I know why we believe what we believe in, why we have confidence in God. Our God, who is a three-member family, three separate beings, love each other and submit to each other in a way that will captivate God's people for all eternity. For all eternity. This is just a drop in the bucket of us understanding the humility of Christ. This will go on forever. That Father or Jesus or Holy Spirit never elevate themselves, never focus on themselves. They're always focused on each other and on us. It is amazing. So this takes place because the time has come for the removing of the seals. When uh, Daniel is shown the time frame, and only Daniel's told to seal it up, talked about that last week, we, we find out that the timing for the opening of the seals is 1798. And so, let, if you'll open up your Bibles to um, Revelation chapter 6, the chapter on the seals, John writes, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures. We're going to go in order. Remember the one, the first one we read in, in chapters four and five, the face of a lion says in a voice like thunder. Only, only one being or a God being has a voice that sounds like thunder. So this is a huge clue on who is speaking. And so you and I need to understand clearly what the invitation is. Jesus removes the seal. He speaks to one of the four living creatures, and that is the Holy Spirit. He speaks to the Holy Spirit. He gives the Holy Spirit an assignment. The Holy Spirit turns to John and says, Come and see 
what the Lamb has given me to do. This is what's going, this is what's going on in, in the vision. How do you explain the actions of an invisible God? See, God wants for us to know how, how does he reveal to us a deity that is invisible? The Holy Spirit is invisible. And so he gives us different um, pictures of the work of the Holy Spirit. This isn't what the Holy Spirit looks like. The Holy Spirit came down on Jesus as a dove. The Holy Spirit was tongues of fire uh, at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit reveals pictures so that we can see how he works and what he is doing because that's the most important thing. As, as we, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are triplets. So really, if you see Jesus, you know what the other two God beings are like. And this is very relevant for us because God has warned us that the only unpardonable sin is what? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. We tend to forget that the Holy Spirit is God. Not wind, not breath, as some people want to make him to be. We can't be put to death because of wind or of breath. It's because of a being that we have defied and that we have ultimately rebelled against. To understand this in a greater way, please read the, the first chapter. It's very extensive in the book of Ezekiel. You find out that the living creatures and their power is in the wheels and they, they transport God's throne all over the globe. And what that's telling us is that the Holy Spirit is our connection to the throne. He connects us to, without the Holy Spirit, we have no connection. The Father cannot be all places at all times because he doesn't exercise that right. Nor does Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit can be all places at all times. And so he is given the task to go to the earth and carry out these very important crusades, missions, or campaigns. Now, we're very familiar with campaigns because we just went through a campaign. The, the whole purpose of, of a campaign is that the person that is campaigning wants to make himself and his agenda known and that his way of government is the best way of government. Basically, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's taking God's, from Jesus, he's taking the mission and taking Jesus out into the world, one step at a time. Hence, that the four living creatures represent the Holy Spirit's work on the earth, is that the, the four living creatures have eyes all around them, meaning all-knowing. The position is next to the Father. Uh, the four living creatures are four clones of the same thing, meaning that they can go in every direction, north, south, east, and west. And in the book of Ezekiel, we find out that they, they travel at the speed of lightning. So just incredible. The voice that speaks, speaks like thunder. So God gives us many little hints that if we put together, the Bible speaks for itself as to who uh, this, the, you know, who the four living creatures are. And it's just the, the tasks that they do. The first living creature, remember, was like that of a lion. The second was like that of an ox. The third had the face of a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. And then we find out also uh, Zacharias sees this as well, but we're going to look at this in a minute, uh, that these are four campaigns or crusades that riders on horses take off and they, they go to do. And we look at the same language in the book of Zechariah. In his vision, uh, the, the horses are pulling chariots and they go to all four corners of the earth. In, in the book of Revelation, um, the, the riders on the horse go, basically it's without pulling anything to, to go even faster. So there's, there's a greater work to do and greater speed is needed. So now let's look at seal one. With the removal of each seal, 
there is something that the Holy Spirit is bringing to the world. And, and the relevancy for us is that from 1798, when Jesus was found worthy, moving forward, there is a great work going on that we can't see. We can't see the Holy Spirit doing it, but we know that it's happening. And God tells us what to look for, for us to know that it's happening. Um, we talked a little bit about last week that in in the times of the Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, the church ruled over people. And salvation came through the church. Salvation came by the, doing the sacraments. Salvation came by doing the, whatever the church dictated for people to do. And people were were just living in oppression and persecution by the church. And Jesus puts a stop to that that when the father issues this no more in 1798 was the time of the French Revolution when the Pope is taken captive, thus breaking the chains of the church and this message that salvation comes by faith in Jesus begins to go out into the world. Not that it wasn't out there before, that people didn't know that, but now corporately for the corporate body, it's going to move forward because we are getting closer to that appointed time of the end. And these three first seals pave the way and prepare the world for the fourth seal, which is the one that we're waiting for right now, which is utter destruction that is going to come upon us. These three seals are very important in preparing the church for the fourth seal. So the, the Holy Spirit tells John, come. The, why the first um, face of the four living creatures is a lion is because it's, this is a relentless conquest to take this message before the world. And I like what Numbers 23 says, it's like a lion that does not rest until it devours its prey. What does the Holy Spirit want to devour? Falsehood about Jesus. Taking deception out and replacing with the truth. I looked in there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. What we are looking at here, and, and many um, of those who, many people who study the Bible think that a bow is a, like a bow and arrow, a weapon. And if you look at the Greek word here, toxin, it's a fabric bow, like a winner's bow. God is telling us that he is taking salvation by faith out into the world. And those who live by faith in Jesus Christ will receive, will be in the winner's circle and receive a crown. And we know that in the, the message to the churches, we know that we will receive a crown. So this is a very important and very difficult task for the Holy Spirit to take before the world. And it's not one that's easy because look at the state of the world right now. One fourth of the planet knows about Jesus. So how far has the Holy Spirit been able to have us, the church, to take the message of salvation into the world? It's not an easy task, is it? The crusade to take the message of salvation by faith goes all the way until the 1260th day. When mercy is over, that's when this task this mission, this crusade that started in 1798 will be over. Monumental task underway right now. And every time you and I share Jesus with someone, we are working with, alongside, and God is using us for his work of taking the message of salvation by faith into the world. Very relevant for us today. To know that God is working. He, it's, he doesn't only give us a few days to accomplish this. He doesn't only give us a few months. This has been going on for many, many, many years. Seal number two. So 
Out goes the message of salvation by faith. Next is the teachings of Jesus. When the Lamb opened the second seal, again, Jesus gives the assignment to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit invites John to come and see what this next task is. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When you look at that, ooh, it sounds very unpleasant, and it is because God's word is a sword. And how many people are conflicted. How many people love hearing the truth? We don't naturally want to hear the truth about anything. We are people who would settle for lies and deception because it's the easy way. But God's word is a sword, and in Ephesians 6, we're told the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And so the Holy Spirit takes the word of God he starts with salvation by faith. That takes off. And then the next task is for the Holy Spirit to bring people into excitement and zeal for the word of God to go out. And during this time, which is in the time of the 1800s, it's a time when people got excited about making copies of the Bible America, uh, Bible societies came up, uh, Bible societies, an organization that exists to translate, print, and distribute Bibles. That's what a Bible society is. And they started popping up all over the globe. And God, the Holy Spirit, gave just a hunger and a thirst for God's word and gave people the desire to do everything that they could to translate, you know, start off with people making copies. Can you imagine that someone would love God's word so much they would sit there and copy pages to be able to give out to people? That people wanted God's word so desperately they would say, can I borrow your Bible for just a little while and copy some passages? Look at us how lazy we are. You can go to the dollar store and buy a New Testament. You can go to the dollar store and buy a Bible. And how often do we read it? How much do we read it? People back in those days saw God's word as treasure and made it a priority to get whatever they could of God's word. And then people that were able, God empowered people with finances to set up printing presses for the sole job of being able to print the Bibles, and then people were excited to take Bibles and distribute them. And as they met new people, can you, can you translate this into my language? Can you translate this into my language? I mean, just the, the zeal and the passion that was going on then is the passion that we need today to read and study something that is so readily available to us. However, we know that the sword of truth brings conflict. What happened to Jesus when he brought the truth into his church at that in his day? The greatest truth that God was telling them about himself was that he was equal to the Father, remember? When he said, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. When the Jews heard that, they tore their clothes in mourning. What a show they put on. Because they believed that Jesus was blaspheming, that he was making himself equal. They understood the language. Today's church is oblivious to what it says because the Jews, at least they knew what God was saying. He was saying he was equal to the Father. And they hated and detested him for that. And Jesus lost his life because of what he told them about who he was. So the Holy Spirit leaves on a mission from God's throne 
to empower and expand the revival that started with taking the message of salvation by faith. The message had started years before in small, we know uh, the life of Martin Luther and others like him that were, you know, trailblazers. But this is a time where, where the Holy Spirit is empowered in a huge way because it's time to begin removing the seals on the book of life. As of September 2020, the full Bible has been translated into 700 languages. I didn't even know there was 700 languages. 700 languages and the New Testament has been translated into an additional 1,548 languages. And then portions, little portions, uh, into 1,138 other languages of people in, in tribal areas that just want, can you just, can you just copy this book? Can you just translate this one book for us? And I think, you know, Lord, give us the desire to spend time in your word. It is in our language. We can read it any time. And we're, what are we spending our time in? Is it no wonder that people will have no confidence in God when the fourth seal is removed because they really don't know who he is? You and I do not want to be part of that number of people that fall away because we had a wrong idea of who God was, that we thought God was here to serve us. We thought God exists for the purpose of making our life comfortable. We thought God existed for the sake of not allowing us to stub our toe and to do without anything. And now God's going to bring wrath on the planet. What is that about? We're warned that people are going to fall away because they don't know the truth about who God is. So they don't know him personally. To know God is to love God. You can't not know really the God of the Bible and not love him. He is an incredible being. Incredible. Now we get somewhere with the third seal. The third seal is huge. I probably won't be able to get past the third seal today. But the third seal is the judgment of Jesus. And it's difficult for people to understand uh, what this seal is about because you have to understand basic truths about what the Bible says that happens when you die. The Bible teaches that when we die, we neither go to heaven nor hell. We sleep in the dust of the earth. If you will do a search, if you will study this one thing, you will find dozens and dozens of references in scripture that talk about sleep. I don't have time to get into that today. Again, if you'll go on to our website, you will find uh, full studies on these topics. But for the sake of keeping with the story of the taking off of the seals on the book of life in order for that book to be opened, we have the salvation of Jesus, we have the teachings of Jesus, and now we have the judgment of Jesus. This happens, the timing for this, you have to know Daniel 9 to understand and, and understand the cleansing of the temple. That's another whole study for this to make sense. And this is what I'm saying. It's like when God, when God puts on my heart to do this study, it's like, oh, it's so big. And I tend to do bunny trails, but I ask the Holy Spirit to keep me from doing bunny trails. So we'll see if we can get through this. The judgment of Jesus is relevant to us today because you and I are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to answer for how we have spent our time and our resources because everything that we have comes from our maker. We don't, what we have, we did, we're not self-made people. We are not, we're not that smart. We have been given gifts. We've been given um, everything that we are is a gift. And God is going to hold us accountable 
for how we have used everything that he has given us. So the third seal tells us that Jesus started judging at that time. This is verse 5. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. Again, the Holy Spirit speaks to, and this is the, um, the, four, the face of a man, the, the, the four living creatures that has the face of a man, and he says, Come. I'm going to show you the, the task that God has given me uh, to take into the world. I looked, and there before me was a black horse, its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand, scales for measuring. Now, what's important about this is that um, when we look at the big picture and we know from Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, that books are opened. And we also learned that from last week in, Revel in Daniel chapter 7, that the court is seated and the books are open. What books are those? Plural is that all of us, every one of us, starting from, from Adam and Eve, have a book of our life choices that's recorded in real time. God is recording all of this. And when we die, when someone dies, and let's say, the first, let's say that Cain, um, Abel was first, because Abel was the first person to die, when Jesus opened up, um, Abel's book, he judges, that's, a, that's scales, remember he goes out with a pair of scales to measure, God wants to know what we did with what we knew. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You'll find, you'll find this language in multiple places in the Bible. And this happens while we sleep. Let's just say that I die tonight, and then tomorrow God's looking at my book. I'm asleep in the dust of the earth. So I'm not physically present. My record is present. So this would be my record, my book, written in real time. God looks at my life, and he looks for this. Love. The law is love for God and love for others. Was Letty willing to love as the Holy Spirit taught her to love? Is there love? Yes or no? And if yes, then Jesus says life for Letty. And if no, then death for Letty. This all happens while we're sleeping. Every person is judged. And Jesus is the judge. We looked at why he's worthy to receive uh, the book because with his life, we, we have been purchased with his life. He gave his life for us. He has redeemed us. And so Jesus is judging each person's life, stamping life and death. This is work that's been going on for many, many, many years, since 1844. <laughs> Since 1844, we have been moving forward with the judgment process because when Jesus comes in his glory from uh, Matthew 25, he separates everybody into two camps. How can he separate them? Because he's already judged them. He's already done the judging. He sep he's separating the sheep from the goats. So then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wage and six pounds of barley for a day's wage. And do not damage the oil and the wine. This is really cool because this is language um, from Solomon's day. This is the currency that was used to pay those that worked on the temple. God's temple when they were building the temple. This is how they were paid. Because this was more valuable than money. And I'm thinking in the days to come... Being paid with food uh, would be much more important than someone giving you a dollar because you can't eat the dollar. Eventually, you're going to be very grateful for this. So God is, God is inviting us to join. Join, come and work for me. This is part of the third angel's, uh, the third seal. Come and work for me, and I guarantee you, 
you will be paid well for your work. Do you trust your God that he will pay you for your work as you are taking who he is out into the world? I mean, that is our purpose. Wonderful people of the Most High God to know him and to make him known. It's our entire purpose. We glorify him by knowing him. I know my God personally. I know who he is from his word. I know how he operates. I know what he has done. I know what he's going to do. I know him personally for my own life. I know how he has loved me, how he loves me, how he disciplines me, how he teaches me. I know him personally. And now it's my desire to make him known, to know him and make him known. It's an invitation for each one of us. And, and he promises to pay us wages. How generous is that? We're not even deserve any wages. We should just want to do it because we love God. I'm not going to go into the next um, seal today. I'll save that for tomorrow. But I want to, uh, as I close today, to talk about the relevancy of knowing these deep things of God. This is not just surface study. It's not just reading through. To understand these things requires a foundation of many other things. Do we know these foundational things? Do we understand how God judges? Do we understand that we can have great confidence in him because he judges fairly? Do we understand that he's working everything for my good to get me to the kingdom? And if I don't make it to the kingdom, it's because I had other priorities. I had better things to do than spend time with God. I didn't know him. I didn't invest in him. I can't just, when things are bad, oh, save me, save me, Lord. That's the foolish virgins, remember? Give me oil. Give me some of your oil. That's wanting someone else's relationship with God. They can't give it to you. You have to get your own. The horror, the terror that will strike people because they don't have what others have is something that I hope none of us experience. I hope that because we have been given this priceless book that we will spend time, that we will ask God to give us what we do not naturally have. It is not natural to want to study God's word. It's not natural. It's not natural for me. I ask him to give me, and he gives me a hunger and a thirst, and then I can't get enough. He gives that to me. It, it, I don't manufacture that, but I have to ask. If I don't have... If you don't have, why not? You're not asking. And why aren't you asking, church? Because you're too busy doing other things that are more important. Your priorities are upside down. And you will find yourself with absolutely nothing at the end of the day. Because after you've done your entertainment for the day, and after you've done your chores, and after you've done whatever it is that consumes your time, at the end of the day, it's you and Jesus. And what do you have with him? Do you know him? Who is he? Is he your Lord and master? Are you having a love relationship with him? Is your love for him growing and thriving because you know that you know that you know that he loves you and you are experiencing that love for yourself so that these things these prophecies are thrilling because they tell you more awesome stuff about who he is 
that's where we need to be. And I promise you, if you will ask the Holy Spirit, and not just, oh, Holy Spirit, can you just give me? No. Get on your knees. Ask him to give you what you don't have. And you know what? This is an everyday thing. God's not going to give you a hunger and thirst that you, that, that it's going to last for what, weeks and months so that you don't have to ask again. So you can just coast. There's no coasting here. There is no coasting. The only, the only coasting that there is is the downstairs elevator. That's a slippery slope down into a lake of fire. The ways of righteousness and holiness is climbing up the mountain. And it's a hard climb. And it's battling the flesh. But you know what is so awesome about it? Is that Jesus is right there with you. He is with you in those trials. He is with you in circumstances that come upon you that you didn't see coming. He is with you when you are mourning. He is with you when you are celebrating. He is with you when you are down. He is with you when you are empty. He is with you. And that, dear ones, is what we need. We need more of Jesus. However much you have of him, you need more more. However much time you're spending in God's word, you need more. However much time you're spending in prayer today, you need more. Don't beat yourself up if you have allowed yourself to get on the slippery slope. Ask Jesus to forgive you and let him raise you up and keep going. And Make sure, like Jesus, that for the joy set before you, for that joy that you see of you in the arms of Jesus with this life passed into eternity, that it was all worth it to ask God to discipline you and to teach you the ways of righteousness. Ah, these things are relevant to us today. There isn't anything in scripture that is not relevant for us today. In every story, in every book, there is some gem that you need. And there is something about God that he wants to reveal to you.